Welcome back to the Six Piece Podcast. We're delving back into Fred Duguay's novel, The Longest Memory, and we're going to be looking at another short chapter, chapter nine. This is the second of three chapters told from Lydia's perspective, and the third one will be actually chapter 10. What happens here is Lydia recounts the day that Mr. Whitechapel, her father, catches her and Chapel reading, and he forbids them to continue doing so. Cook later finds Lydia and suggests that her and Chapel meet at night in secret in order to continue reading together. And the chapter closes with the two characters expressing their love for one another and wanting to continue their relationship. Given the fact that Mr. Whitechapel forbids Lydia from teaching Chapel how to read the themes of racism and discrimination, education and equality are quite prevalent within this chapter, but also freedom. And I also wanted to mention the idea of love, especially love from a parent, which is showcased through Cook and the way that she wishes to not only protect Lydia and her son, but also encourage what they're doing, which is forbidden by law. But let's start with the reading of the chapter. Chapter nine, Lydia. This is a day we are reading and my father enters the room and these days are brought to an abrupt end. Chapel, I call him Chapel like his mother, comes in as usual and sits. I hear the voice loud and clear without a trace of the tremor and hesitation that surrounded it when we began two years ago. At what point do I stop hearing the words and listen to the voice alone and realize I am in love with its cadence? My body is suddenly hot. The thought spins my head. It is so clear an idea that I'm sure it has left my body and skips around the room in celebration. I open my eyes to see what shape my love has taken and there is my father standing with his legs apart and his hands on his hips. Chapel jumps quicker than I. The volume of Shakespeare's plays flies across the room and flutters several of its leaves in the air. Both Chapel and I scramble after them. Father orders me out of the room in his stern voice reserved for reprimanding slaves. I am so scared I obey, but I'm more scared for Chapel. I realise I love a boy three years my junior. I realise I am in love with a slave. Chapel is in trouble because of me. Father has forbidden him to come to the house. Father tells me if I fraternise with Chapel, I will surely bring calamity and shame tumbling through the roof of his house. He tells me Chapel and I must never see the light of day together, must never read together, nor write, nor sit together in the house, nor exchange written communication, nor speak of these wicked secret meetings to anyone. By teaching little Whitechapel to read and write when he can never use it, you have done him the gravest injustice. I want to reply that a law which says a slave should not read and write is unjust. But I look at my feet and nod when he inquires whether I've heard every word. He said it might be possible in the future. I look up at him and, as if to dash my hopes of a future, when Chapel and I could sit and read together, he adds, in the next century, perhaps. I shake my head, not in disappointment, but out of total despair. The next century? Chapel and I will both be with our maker in heaven, and then it will be too late. This is a world we find ourselves in. We have to learn to live with it, otherwise we will be miserable and bring trouble tumbling into our, onto our heads. I understand, Father. I understand perfectly. This is a day I am in the reading room, dreaming when Cook comes in. My dream is always the same. Chapel at the door scratching. Chapel with his leg curled around the door, pushing and pulling, altering the light shaped like a door on the floor and then not. Chapel in the room. Chapel sitting opposite me. Chapel on the edge of my chair. Chapel's legs touching mine. Chapel's hands in my hands. Chapel's voice washing over me. Cook said the days were getting short and short days were a blessing. I asked how so. She said they were a gift from God because of the beautiful nights when the stars shone and winked if you looked at them. She said there was a special place to sit and look at the heavens. If I go there and another person is there in the dark, she said I should not be afraid because he is there for the same specific purpose. This is the night I go out through the back door 
after mother and father have settled in their bed. I pick my way in starlight. No shadows. The stars glow, but the shine is too weak to cast a shadow, though I imagine seeing my own, slithering beside me like a companion. I get to a place close in the house, close to the house, behind an old wooden shed. I think I am alone. I look up and lean on what I take to be a part of the shed. The wall is warm and gives a little before straightening again. I look up some more to allow the back of my head to find a place to rest. My head touches a shape much like its own. Do I think stars really wink? Asks the voice I've missed for several weeks. The voice trembles a little, but I recognise it will soon settle. Of course they wink. When a star shoots, where does it land? I reply, I want one to shoot now so that I can make a wish, but that I cannot say if they land at all. He said the stars put out their light to avoid disturbing people when they land. He said the sound of a star landing was just like a felled tree hitting the ground. What would you wish, Chapel? I can't believe I'm in this company and I'm saying his name. Chapel. He says if he reveals his wish to me, it will surely never be granted. How so? My father told me it spoils a wish if you tell it to the person who is part of that wish. Your father is right. My father is always right. He is more proud of his father than I am of mine. We watch the stars. My back becomes a thousand fingertips feeling his breathing. I try to match my breathing to his. We agree to meet on clear nights. How was the reading, Lydia? Not good without you. Memorise something for when we meet next time. And what will you do? I will compose something in my head. He says he cannot disobey my father. He gave him his word. He refuses my offer to bring him books and paper. He asks me to be his eyes and read for him and be his pen and write down what he says to me on the clear nights. Chapel, I want to say, all my memory is yours. I ransack my head for everything I have read, but come up with fragments. He stops me and says we can start next time we meet. I will devour Father's library for you. I will leave room for your words because my head is as big as the heavens. The stars seem to get near, then they join up and blur. I blink my eyes clear of the water clouding them, and Chapel asks if the stars have become one and blurred. Yes, Chapel. Don't turn around, otherwise I will, I will have disobeyed your father. I love you, Lydia. I love you, Chapel. We both know it cannot go on. Nevertheless, we carry on with these meetings. We spend our nights apart watching the sky from the clarity we know will bring us together. On clear summer nights, the cotton harvests continue until the last morsel of light is swallowed by the dark. I pray for the short winter days. Winter somehow brings more evenings than summer. At least the nights are longer. Sometimes I see stars when there are none and brave the night air. Of course, he's not there, but... I imagine I smell him and convince myself I just missed him. So let's look at some key quotations from chapter nine. The first one, I realise I'm in love with the slave, and that chapel is in trouble because of me. These two sentences, back to back consecutive sentences, highlight two very different opposing conflicting emotions, one of love and one of guilt. Her love is, goes against, I guess, her family, her father in particular, but also society at the time. It's forbidden to be in relationship with an enslaved human. And then it's the guilt that she feels. What she feels is a really, really good thing that she's doing, a really positive thing that she's doing, that she's helping Chapel is in fact hindering him and has gotten him in trouble, and she is to blame for that. And that is a little bit the same as what we saw in the first chapter when Whitechapel feels guilty for the death of his son. So both of them feel that guilt for Chapel and the situation or the situations that he finds himself in. The second quote is from Mr. Whitechapel. He says to, to Lilia, by teaching little Whitechapel to read and write when he can never use it, you have done him the gravest injustice. Once again, it's a reference to the racist laws in place at the time where education was deprived from enslaved humans in order to suppress them. And once again, just highlighting the fact that he'll never be able to use it regardless. What is, I guess, significant about that is the chapter that we read earlier on from Chapel's perspective, which is written in verse. It's poetry. It's the most impressive, complex chapter there is, especially when you look at Sanders Senior's 
chapter, which is short, sharp diary entries, vulgar graphic language as well, where he recounts the abuse at the hands of Cook. So this is why, again, it is a significant point because there's irony there. He's the best writer. He's the best reader, yet he'll never be able to use it in this society. Hence why the North becomes paradise to them, which we'll go on in more detail in the next chapter. The next quote, he said it might be possible in the future, in the next century perhaps. I shake my head, not in disappointment, but out of total despair, because this is the world we find ourselves in. And there's that juxtaposition. The hope of an optimism for the future, the fact that this might actually be able to happen one day, but the despair that she feels that she's, you know, been born into the world at this exact moment. One where there is a clear difference, where there is significant racial and discriminatory laws in place to avoid this. You'll also notice in this chapter, there's a section where she repeats Chapel's name about five or six sentences in a row. You can definitely analyse that as well, because Chapel is in the forefront of her mind at all times. That's the overwhelming love that she feels for him. The penultimate quote is the beautiful nights when the stars shine and winked if you looked at them. Again, we've got this imagery, this motif of light and stars being really positive, but also shrouded by darkness. So it's a positive relationship, the loving relationship between Chapel and Lydia, shrouded by the dark, despairing atmosphere of the South, where their relationship is forbidden. And the last quote, we both know it cannot go on. Nevertheless, we carry on with these meetings. There is a sense of hopelessness here. And of course, I've mentioned the dramatic irony, which is the fact we already know that Chapel dies trying to escape from the plantation. And there's a bit of a callback as well here about the star-crossed lovers and the reference to, to, to Shakespeare. And we'll see more references to Shakespeare in the next chapter as well. Let's look at some connections to seven stages of grieving. And the first point about compliance and gender is a bit of a repetitive one. We looked at this one already a couple of times worth you know, emphasizing again. So Lydia's position as a woman means she must comply with her father's demands. Like Cook, except I guess Cook, Cook's fate is in the hands of her husband. The next chapter will see Lydia particularly quite vulnerable, given her status as a woman, and her family will look for a husband for her and almost present potential husbands to her because that's an expectation. Women really lacked agency, both those who were enslaved humans and those that even weren't. They really lacked a sense of agency and control over their life. And this can link once again to Invasion Poem, scene 10 from the seven stages of grieving and the treatment of women at the hands of the non-Indigenous settlers. The next point is about love and acceptance. So the relationship between Lydia and Chapel, uniting both sides here, is similar to the Reconciliation March, where you've got both the First Nations community and the non-Indigenous community marching together in order to achieve acceptance. Support is needed on both sides here for a positive outcome to occur. What's different, I guess, is Lydia and Chapel are individuals. They're an individual experience, whereas a reconciliation march is more of a collective, collaborative experience between two sections of the community in order to seek change. The last one I wanted to mention was filial relationships. So relationships between parents and their children. We'll start with Lydia's father, who believes that because she's teaching Chapel how to read and write, that she will surely bring calamity and shame tumbling through the roof of this house. Just as a side note, What's interesting is that Mr. Chapel also felt shame, and that's outlined in the plantation owners chapter previously. The notion of shame is expressed in the seven stages of grieving in the scene story of a brother, where shame is felt by a father towards his son. Now, I've mentioned there are also stage directions, and I think that's really important because there are stage directions in that particular scene that talk about the sound of laughter. So the sound of laughter juxtaposed with the shame being felt by both sides, by both the brother and the father as well, just heightens that, heightens that, that tension. I will say though that the brother-father or the son-father-son relationship in Seven Stages of Grieving is different to Chapel and Lydia's because the brother is unable to break out of that cycle. You know, he's stuck in this cycle of addiction, crime, incarceration that he can't break out of. And he feels a sense of shame, especially towards his father. 
And because of that, it only deepens that negative relationship. He feels bad for his dad, and therefore he acts out upon it, and he can't break that. Whereas Chapel, well, Chapel's got support from Cook, and she's the one that actually encourages them and provides them with the opportunity to continue their relationship, to continue their education and their loving relationship. And I've mentioned it yet it's different due to racism, and, and it's that quote here, in our family, to be shamed out like that eats your spirit and your life. That's from Story of a Brother. And I think this scene is really, really important because, again, there's no specific name given to the brother. So this is an experience felt by so many First Nations people, that, that, that cycle that they can't break out of. And shame plays such a significant role in impacting on their ability to change and to seek a better life.